Ladies and gentlemen, this is somebody who not just, is not just studying change and continuity, but is looking to make change. Won't you welcome Scott Rosell. Thank you, Clay, and Sandra, and Ruby, and uh, the, the whole team, the 1990 Institute. I was, really had the, uh, the fortune of, of being at the first one uh, six years ago, and wow, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, they're doing it better and better, for sure. So it's, uh, um, I was thinking about who you guys are, um, and I was thinking about what I want you to take away back to your students. And, oh my gosh! So I started cramming all this stuff into my PowerPoint, right? <laughs> and, and so I got to really, really tell myself, you know, let's. Um, I want to try to get through a lot of it, and then we can follow up uh, with um, at, at lunchtime, or you can email me, and um, we can do do other stuff. So uh, I'm really going to try to try to go go through a lot of material. Um, uh, it's about human capital. I call it the other China. Um, uh, that's what uh, I'm really going to try to convey to you today. Uh, I, the reason I called the other China is when I was going to school <laughs> in uh, the 60s uh, in Southern California and in, uh, in uh, junior high school and high school and then the 70s I was at, at Berkeley. Uh, uh, this was required reading by Michael Harrington. It's called The Other America. And he was a journalist who who went through the U.S. He spent three years living in inner city um, uh, tenements out in rural areas of uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. And uh, he wrote this book. And it was about the invisible America. Uh, it's about poverty in America. It's about the social problems in America. And um, the first copy that came off the press, he handed it to uh, John F. Kennedy. And Kennedy read this book and it had such an impact on him. He, Kennedy started the war on poverty in, in the 60s. Of course, Johnson took it, took it public. And uh, uh, the, the one thing we've now had over 50 years of the war on poverty, uh, there was just a 50-year look back on the, uh, on the impacts. And the number one impact that almost everybody agrees um, there's been successes and failures was a success was what happened with rural education. Um, uh, to that, and it was uh, it, it was a time when local school districts in poor southern, poor Appalachia, poor Midwest areas wouldn't invest in rural education. Why? It was really easy, right? As, as soon as we, we teach those poor blacks and poor whites how to read and write and, and do arithmetic, guess what? They get up and leave. <laughs> they go to Chicago and Detroit and California and the East Coast. Uh, and so why should we? I mean, it was actually draining the labor force. It was picking cotton uh, in there. So, so there was a real incentive. And, and Kennedy decided he was going to central to federalize funding of rural schools. Um, uh, he wanted to federalize the funding of inner city schools too, but the mayors objected and it never happened. Um, and uh, of course, you know, we have 50 years of, of funding. So, so this is the background of a book that was supposed to be titled The Other China. <laughs> uh, this is a book coming out in March uh, of mine. This is, uh, I've been, been writing, uh, 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 Clay talked about uh, my, my, my work on village leaders. Uh, that was uh, like 30 years ago as my dissertation, right? Uh, I've never written a book, <laughs> um, written a lot of papers. Uh, so this is coming out, it's supposed to be called The Other China, the publisher gets to choose the title. Um, so it's called The Invisible, China's invisible crisis. That's what I want to sort of talk about today. Uh, I'm going to do three things. I want to do some theory <laughs> very quickly. Human capital inequality and middle income trap. That means uh, how countries get stuck in middle income and that's where China is today. Uh, the second thing I'm going to talk about the nature of the other China's human capital um, which I'm going to claim is a real danger of of one of the reasons why China could fall into this middle income trap. And then I'm going to talk about some of the sources, and the sources are going to be uh, embodied in uh, rural education and health. Um, uh, 
This is all the theory I'm going to give you, okay? It's on one graph. <laughs> uh, let, let me tell you the graph real, real quick. Um, think of this as income after World War II, and think of this as income today. So here are the, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to, for, for lack of a better word, the basket cases, right? Somalia, Congo, Myanmar, right? They were poor 80 years ago. They're really, really poor today, okay? Uh, here's OECD countries, right? Uh, uh, Canada, Sweden, England, Australia, right? They were rich 50 years ago. They're rich today, okay? Uh, I, I want to think about two sets of countries, okay? I, I want to think about, I call them the graduates. The graduates are a set of countries that 50 years ago were poor and today, or were in middle income, and today are rich, rich developed countries, high income. Thing to do is notice a couple things. <laughs> There's not very many of them. <laughs> right? This is a really hard thing to do, right? There's only about 15 to 20 countries, you know, the Singapore, Spain, Iceland, Ireland, New Zealand, Israel, Korea. I mean, it's, a, it's a, the other thing to notice, it's, it's been 20 years since a country's graduated. <laughs> In the last 20 years, no country has moved from middle income to high income. This is a really hard thing to do. Brazil got right to the edge <laughs> three or four years ago, and what's happened, right? Their GDP per capita is down 20%, uh, and, and lots of people get hurt. So, so th that's the first group. The other group are the trapped, <laughs> okay? This is most of the countries in the world, as a matter of fact, they've been there for 70 years, right? And it's not that they're in this nice equilibrium, right? It's they grow, 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 collapse, grow, 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 collapse. And when they collapse, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of uh, social unrest. There's a lot of political uprising. Uh, you know, fortunately for us, <laughs> most of these countries are very small. So you get these collapses and th there may be disruption. Those guys, we hardly feel it here, right? So, uh, of course, sort of thinking ahead, <laughs> uh, if China is in that group and China does the stagnation or collapse, uh, you better believe that, uh, that the world will feel it uh, because of some of the things, you know, the, the size that we've been talking about. So, so what are the differences between these groups and these groups? There are, there are a number of them. One of the most fundamental, one of the least talked about, I think, are the nature of the economy's hu human capital. <laughs> at the time these countries were middle income. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna compare the countries that graduated when they were middle income and the countries today that are middle income. They have extremely different human capital. And when I say human capital, I'm, I'm gonna use a definition of the whole labor force. So this is everybody from 20 to 65. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the share of that body of people that have been to high school or higher, okay? that. Why? It's because they have the skills that are needed to participate productively in a high-income economy, because that's where these countries are going, right? And so, you know, do, does this labor force, can they, they participate in this high-income country? And look at this. Here's the trapped, right? So this is Turkey, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, all those countries here. Look, look at it. It's actually quite remarkable. You know, uh, 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 10 people in the labor force, only three of them, or four of them, have ever been to high school. There's six or seven of them that what we call, in developed countries, high school dropouts, right? Uh, which is an ugly term, right, in a developed country. Of course, of course in middle-income countries, you know, high school dropouts have lots of things to do. But what I'm thinking about is now the country wants to become a high-income country, and you have to take all these high school dropouts and do something with them, okay? So that, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Um, let's compare that to those graduates, right? Look at this. At the time that they were middle income, now of the 10 people in the over seven of them are, have high school educations or higher. Okay, I mean, that's a huge difference. It's exactly double. Um, look at, let's compare those middle income grads to OECD high income countries. They, th th that's the remarkable thing that these countries already had high income 
uh, human capital, uh, levels of human capital and labor force as, as developed countries, as high income countries. So, so they already said, we're going to get our workforce completely ready to move up here, and they do. <laughs> okay? Uh, while these countries, you know, I think it's one of the reasons that they, that, that they really, uh, uh, really have problems. Because when they move from middle income to high income, wages rise fast. China's wages are rising really fast. Uh, I lived in China for a year um, in, in the early 2000s, and we just bought an apartment in Beijing. It was the best thing I ever did, you know. It was, it was crazy. At that, in, in 2001, they like gave, foreigners could borrow money from the bank and buy an apartment. They were really, really trying to make us buy it. You know, three years later, uh, foreigners couldn't even buy an apartment, right? Uh, because things, uh, prices were going up. Best thing I ever did. Uh, 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 and, and we lived there for a year. We hired a, uh, a, um, a woman to work with us to keep house to cook for us while, while we both had, my wife and I both had our jobs, uh, hired her for a thousand yuan a month. And it was like, people said, oh, you're paying her too much. We, we ended up really, uh, we, we're still in contact with the family. Uh, the, the kids have all gone to college. It's a fantastic story. Um, she, she was from Chongqing. Today, it costs 10,000 yuan to hire a woman to work in your house. That, that's 15 years. Wages have gone up 10 times, okay? So wages are really, really uh, fine. And there's two reasons they're going. If you, if you do your, your basic economics, right, is uh, demand, China's still growing, so demand's rising, and Clayton already talked about that. Uh, we're past peak labor. There's 4 million people who retire more than the new uh, entrance into the labor force. So the, the supply is falling and wages are going to rise, are rising and will continue to rise. So what happens if you can't participate in this high wage, high income economy is there's a polarization. You get lots of people who drop out of the labor force uh, and they're unemployed. There's crime, there's social unrest. It's, uh, you know, think of Mexico. Right? Does everybody know what Mexico was known at in the late 1980s? I mean, there's probably some, it was called the New Taiwan, <laughs> right? Everyone thought that Mexico was going to be the next big rising star. Of course, it hit 1994, it had the peso crisis, and since 1994, Mexico has had zero growth rate. It's the same level in today as it was in 1994. And uh, those uh, 10 million people who were laid off in the early 1990s, what did they do? <laughs> they did three things. <laughs> we know one thing, they came to the United States. Um, and uh, we're trying to stop that now, <laughs> but uh, I hope we don't because it's really benefited us. And it's a two, uh, they went into the informal workforce. Three, they went into crime and organized crime and gangs. And, and th that's what that part of the labor force does when you can't, um, uh, when, when the country's not rich enough to, to provide high unemployment benefits, et cetera. Uh, of course, that leads to lower productivity, investment climate changes, no one wants to invest. Massive amounts of Mexico money flew, <laughs> flowed into the U.S. and it went to China <laughs> as, as, uh, as people relocated their factories. Uh, stagnation, polarization, you stay in middle income, okay? So that, that's what it is. So that's the theory, okay? <laughs> uh, that human capital labor forces really, really help. So here's China, <laughs> okay? Uh, in this middle income area, uh, if you draw a 45 degree line there, it's quite a ways off that line. That means it's done a lot of growth over the past 50 years, and we know that, right? And so uh, th that's the good news. Um, Let's look at China's human capital to see if they're going to be able to be one of those that grows up into th this next stage, can graduate. Uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, yeah, what share of the labor force is going to high school, okay? We've already talked about that. So where is China? This will probably surprise most people. Of all those middle-income countries in the world, China is number one, low. It has the worst human capital in the entire middle-income world, 
Okay, number one low. When you tell people in China this, they can barely believe it, right? And they say, where did you get your data, Professor Roselle? Uh, I, I, I did a survey of 1.3 billion people. Uh, oh, no, that was called the census, uh, <laughs> uh, right? Exactly. And, and in the 2010 census, the first time the census said, what's your level of education attainment, okay? And th these are the data, right? So here's, here's 20 to 65. These are all the people who, uh, in, in the whole country and uh, it, so here's a 50 year old I didn't go to school I went to primary school I went to junior high here I went to high school or higher okay so let's just cut that out how many people have been to high school or higher all those numbers that I showed you on that other graph were done exactly the same way um, uh, by, by OECD uh, data and so you can see that that's 25 percent it's actually 24 percent in 2010 I gave this talk in China, and people got really upset. They couldn't believe it, number one. And number two, they said, well, it's because it's, 10, it's 2010. We've grown so fast. So I went and looked at the next micro census, and it's, uh, and it's higher. I mean, and it's actually growing. But still, it's only 30%, okay? And let's, uh, you know, it, it, so, so this is how that's done. Let's compare China's 30%. So out of 10 people in the labor force, only three have ever been to high school. They're, China's lower than South Africa, lower than Turkey, low, lower than Mexico, right? This is the Mexico that hasn't grown in the last, in the last year. So China is, is the lowest of all of these countries, okay? Wow, I mean, you know, that's, that's you know, what... How do you become, you know, a high-income country? Um, uh, I often say um, uh, China very much wants to join OECD. Uh, to join OECD, you have to have a per capita income higher than the poorest country in OECD, which is Mexico, by the way. Um, uh, and and China is almost ready to pass Mexico. It'll be a few more years. It depends on, on Mexico a little, too. Uh, but if they pass, they want to join OECD. If they join OECD, guess what? The OECD rate of 78% of human capital will fall to 62% because China is so big <laughs> and has such poor levels of education. So, so uh, uh, China is, is a, 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 we, we hope that they can do it. So, um, uh, and of course, what I keep telling people is, is being a high school dropout in China today is not a problem, right? There's lots of jobs for high school dropouts. There's lots of jobs that do very productive things, right? Of course, you know, um, where is this going to be made in two or three years, right? Four or five years. What? It's going to be made in Hayward, California, right? Uh, and China's going to lose 5 million jobs. And guess what Samsung just did? Samsung just moved their entire assembly work to North Vietnam. Uh, I just attended a conference about a, a, a few months ago in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and we took a trip out to the Deng Xiaoping export zone. Um, it actually isn't, but somebody spray painted this over the, the, the sign. I thought that was just great. Because you come in and there's this, 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 this office complex that says, for English, go here. For Mandarin, go here. For Wenzhou Hua, go here. Wenzhou is in southern Zhejiang. It's where all the really cheap stuff in the world over the past 20 years, was everything in Walmart was made in Wenzhou. Uh, it's not made in Wenzhou anymore because the Wenzhou people went to Hangzhou, sold their house, sold their business, took their cash, went to Bangladesh, and invested in 10 cent an hour labor. Um, and, um, and, and so th this, is, this is what's happening. High school dropouts are going to be a problem when a country like China comes high income. What are they going to do? Those jobs aren't there anymore. Okay, so, um, uh, so is this a secret? <laughs> okay, uh, I don't know if anybody, you know, the, the, the top leadership could tell you these exact figures, but I think deep down they know it's a big problem. 
Okay. In fact, they're doing something about it. I often say we, we, we have a very, very productive relationship with the government. We, we do these big randomized trials. We'll, we'll go out and we'll find that kids, I'll, I'll show you some of this data in a second. We go out and we, we find kids have uh, anemia, so they're micronutrient deficient. They're, they don't have enough iron. They don't eat enough meat is really what it is. Uh, and we'll go out to 100 schools. Um, and we'll test them from anemia and give them a math test, and then we'll randomize 50 of them. We'll go give them a vitamin, or we'll give them a school, free school lunch, or we'll give them uh, 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 iron-fortified soy sauce or something like that, right? And uh, we did uh, nine different experiments. 50 of them don't get anything. We come back a year later and measure their math scores, and lo and behold, if you give them a vitamin, their math scores go up <laughs> by 40 percent. That's the kind of stuff we do. Um, uh, uh, we work with nutritionists to get it right because we're economists. We just measure. Uh, so, um, uh, and, um, so we have a very productive relationship with the government. Sometimes they think we're really criticizing. I mean, I, that's your own data show this, right? I mean, I, I'm not trying to criticize. I'm trying to get you to do it. And when the China government knows there's a problem, they do something. Uh, look at what they're doing about high school. This isn't the whole labor force now. These are 15 to 17 year olds, okay? So these are all 15 to 17 year olds across China, rural, rural and urban. In 2005, only half of them went to high school, okay? Now, back in 19, <laughs> the, the 60 year olds back in the 60s and 70s, you know, only 10% of them went to high school, right? That's why we have 30% high school attendance rate. In 2005, it was still only half. Right? But look at by 2014, almost 90% have gone. China has added 10 million new slots in high school in the past 10 years. Okay, 10 million new slots. You know all those middle income countries that graduated, like Ireland, New Zealand, uh, Israel? You add them all together, there's not 10 million people in those countries, right? I mean, I mean, China is just, and the leaders know we have to, Xi Jinping wants to universalize. They want to take this to 100% by 2020 and make high school free. High schools in China is actually the most expensive high school in the whole world right now, uh, but they, they're going to make it free, okay? So they know, they know that this is a problem. So how are they gonna do this? They have to do, <laughs> it's really a rural problem, okay? So these are separating this data by urban and rural. 93% uh, of urban kids go to high school. Is, is that pretty high? That's pretty high. Uh, do you know what it is in the United States? What's the share of our 15 to 17 year olds, our 18 year olds, that's how it's calculated, 18 year olds that graduate? 80 wow. <laughs> percent. I know. Wow. Now, 10 percent of people go back and take a GED test at some time in their life, and so our graduation rate's about 90 percent. Germany, the great Germany, is 92 percent, <laughs> okay? Uh, urban China is better than Germany <laughs> in terms of graduating from high school. The problem is here, rural. Only 70 percent of kids uh, uh, go to high school today. A lot of that is also academic high. Uh, I'm not even going to get into that, which really needs to improve uh, quality. But um, remember that there's every four kids in China, 15-year-olds in China, three of them are rural and only one is urban. All right, so 70% of 75%, this is where it has to be uh, done. And it really is a poor rural area problem. This is in 2010 to 13, our data. Oops, sorry, today it's 50% of kids in poor rural areas. So, so this is where, uh, if, if China's gonna universalize rural education, they have to go out to these poor rural areas. Yes? Okay, let, let me explain. Good, thank you for asking, Claire. Uh, we, we should probably have a whole lecture on the hukou system, but probably most people here know. So in China, uh, I'll be a little flippant here, right? Everybody has a tattoo right here that says rural or urban, right? It actually is your passport, 
right, is you have a, and if you have a rural passport, right, uh, you only have access to your rural social services in your own county. Um, uh, you can only go to high school in your own county. You can only uh, go to the hospital in your own county. There's some reimbursement across, it's really hard though, okay? Um, while urban people go get those same services in the city, just, the empirical facts are the social services in urban areas are much, much better than, than rural areas, okay? Now, 38%, so first of all, 55% of people in China today live in cities, okay? So it's, it's urbanized, it's over half, okay? However, only 38, 39 have an urban passport, okay? Plus all of those people only had one kid, max, Okay, so they only have 24% of the 3 to, to 12, the 15 year olds. So only 25% of kids have an urban passport. Uh, the rural people who are 60, 61, 62, 63% of them have this rural passport. They all had two kids <laughs> or three. All right, they paid big fines. Today they don't get fined, but they used to. So there's 75% of the kids are rural. So uh, this is a, 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 a little known fact. And so it's, uh, yeah. So Many of them actually live in the city. They live in the city. Uh, so, and it's mostly their parents live in the city, right? So the parents move to the city, get a job, get a job making really nice things for us, right? But they take their kids and leave them in the countryside because they get free education, they get uh, health care, uh, subsidized health care there. It's not very good health care, not very good education, but that's it's the only place they can get educated. If they bring their kids to the city, which some people do because their grandma and grandpa you know, uh, are either too busy or they're not around and they're not able to raise the kids, um, then they have to put their kid in a private uh, migrant school, which are really bad because they're run, uh, they just, they're unregulated, uh, expensive, huge class sizes as people try to reduce costs of education. So th this is a, th this rural urban passport is a, is a, is a fundamental fact of China. It's, it's, you know, uh, well, the only other country in the world that has that is North Korea. So um, this is a, uh, I always say, I say, you guys, there's 222 countries in the world. Only two of them have this rural urban huko system. And that's you guys and North Korea. And I go, when are you going to get rid of it? They go, never. I mean, it's, it's so embedded in Chinese society right now. It's going to be, and they've relaxed. There's relaxing here. And then they're tightening. And it goes back and forth. But it's, it's going to be a hard thing to to, to change. Okay, um, <laughs> last slide. Here's China's urban versus rural today. <laughs> Here's South Korea and Taiwan in the 70s. Remember there, the, the wages are $1 an hour and every single person in Taiwan goes to high school. Not every single, but uh, 80 to 85 percent of the people. Uh, every single person in South Korea <laughs> went to high school. <laughs> and uh, th there's a great, the reason I really started doing urban, uh, I'm sorry, uh, rural education is there was a, uh, I was in a conference in the mid 2000s, about 2006, 2007, and uh, it was in South Korea and a, a video uh, documentary maker, a woman, had this fantastic video. And she showed this video she'd made in 1979. It was a woman who was sewing in a factory, and she called it the sweatshop. It was, you know, it was Korean words. It was called the sweatshop. These women not only work all day in this factory for, you know, 90 cents an hour, but they also are forced to go to school at night <laughs> and get their high school degree. Why would they ever do that? So, she, she, you know, she, this is a young, <laughs> uh, young artist, right? Really, come And guess what? She goes, finds that young woman 25 years later, and she's in an office. She's an assistant to an accountant and is doing computer work, right? Because she went to high school, right? And uh, so... Um, uh, 
so this is really, so I keep telling the Chinese government, this is a problem of Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, right? So look at this. This is Mao. Mao only let about, about 10% of the people go to high school, but then he greatly expanded it during the 60s and 70s. Deng took over. On this day, he shut down half the high schools because he said, I, I went to Tokyo and I learned that elite high schools are really important because you have to have a really elite who then will go and become elite college students. And of course, we know that Chinese has fantastic elite high school and college education, right? That's, that's not their problem, uh, Dung did. And it's only been over the last 30 years, and here's where the acceleration happens. Dung dies this year, and they finally accelerate high school and college. Okay, uh, it's Zhu Rongji, Wen Jiabao, Hu Jintao are the ones that, that really, that, that they really believe in education here, okay? So um, uh, I, I, I'm running out of time. I'm going to, um, the, the challenge for the government today then is to get poor kids into high school, like we talked, but uh, I, I have a colleague at Stanford named Eric Hanishek, and he, we, we know him as the father of the economics of education field, okay? And er, Eric uh, was George Bush's advisor uh, for Leave No Child Behind, and, but he always has one basic principle. He says, if we're going to get all these kids into school, we want to make sure they're learning, right because if you get a kid into school and he's not learning right it's a he calls it the double waste you're wasting fiscal resources and you're wasting the family's time okay um and so uh the the, the question is I'm, I'm gonna skip skip ahead here uh at, 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 well, ba basically what this well, i'll just say what i'll say what this is is this is from junior high we followed 175 schools of junior high kids and we gave them a baseline test, and half the kids told us, I want to go to high school. Half the kids said, I don't want to go to high school, okay? And guess what? The kids who went to high school uh, were, were scoring about a year and a half higher in math than the kids that said they didn't want to go to high school. That's not surprising, okay? But then we followed the kids through junior high, and guess what? The kids who want to go to high school learned a lot. They learned a lot of math, so their math scores go up here. Guess what? Those kids that weren't in the high school, <laughs> didn't want to go to high school, they actually not only didn't learn, they had negative learning. So they knew less in eighth grade than they knew in sixth grade. <laughs> so now the, the question then is why, okay? Um, and, and that's the, 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 the rest of my talk. One of the reasons why is I go and say it's because they don't learn in primary school. The other thing is, is they they didn't develop cognitively when they were babies. They had uh, zero to three, their parents had, you know, weren't there. Grandma was raising these college kids as if they were peasants, okay? So uh, the college, they gotta go to college, but they're raising them like they're peasants. And look what happens, is in junior high in China today, you give them an IQ test, is half of the kids have IQs under 90. Uh, I, I, I think it's 87. If you, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. If you have an IQ of 87 or lower, you actually sort of uh, um, you qualify for special ed in many, many states. So, so, but this is half of the kids here, right? Um, and, and look what happened. Nobody cares about IQ and trying to they care about math scores. Here's IQ, here's math scores. These are the kids with low IQ. And guess what? That's why they aren't learning, okay? Is they have these low IQ. And, and this is a, a correlation between IQ and math. The kids who have a normal IQ, I mean, this isn't high IQ. These are just normal IQs, is they're learning a lot. The Chinese school system teaches them a lot. Uh, uh, the, the, the rest of my talk, and I'm, I'm done now, is uh, uh, you guys can have this PowerPoint here, is the, the absence of learning in primary school. And it's not because the facilities aren't good. It's not because the teachers aren't there. In India, kids don't learn because the teacher's not there. Every teacher goes to school every day in China. The teachers are there. They've rebuilt the schools. The schools are beautiful. The problem is the kids are sick is two-thirds of Chinese rural kids have anemia, they have intestinal worms, or they have vision problems. They might have some other things, but two-thirds of them have one of those three conditions. 
those are conditions that affect learning. No wonder they don't learn. Two-thirds of rural kids have one of those three conditions. Uh, the other thing is this poor, uh, sorry, is poor cognitive development, and this is a problem of babies, and it's a problem that parents leave their babies with grandma, go away, and the babies are malnourished. They're, they're, they're fat because they eat lots of, lots of manto and lots of rice and porridge, but they don't eat a balanced meal and they're micronutrient deficient, number one. And two is traditional Chinese society says, I want to keep my kid safe. I love my kid. I want to keep my kid healthy. I don't want to let them die. I want them to grow up strong. But they have never thought that you should talk to your kid. You don't stimulate your kid. You say, do you read to your kid? And they, they giggle. Read to my baby. There's not a book in a Chinese rural house household. There's not, the, no one has a book. Because they would never read to their kid. They giggle at that. Now, what we've done is we've trained them to do that. And the first month, the mom just turns red when she's talking to their baby. And her mother-in-law is scolding her. You know, she's wasting her time. Okay. Three months later, the mom gets it. She goes, wow. You know, of course, everybody's comparing their baby to everyone else, right? And my baby's doing so well. And they, we have a stack of letters this high that says, thank you for doing this, right? And guess what? After six months, a year of training, their IQs are normal. So those are, those are the reasons there. I, I'm going to stop right there. I look forward to conversation with you. And you guys are the heroes, Clayton said, uh, teaching this stuff to, to the, the kids who are going to take over for us. And they're going to be the ones that are going to be confronting this world in 2030 to 2050. Thank you very much.